So today in, the, in this message, we're going to be talking about David and how he was a king of in, uh, integrity. That we can look at David and we can say that David was a conqueror of Goliath. We can say that he was the commander of Israel's armies. That he became king over Israel. He was a man's man. And what a feat. He went from shepherd boy to, to the palace as king. He had that moment. He, he arrived. That David had a great history with God. His life was marked with greatness. And you can safely say that he arrived at greatness. I think most of us, we can sit back and say, if I arrived at greatness, it would look like this. That this is where I would want to go. This is what I would say. I've arrived when this happens. And I think one of the things that happens so often is when we arrive, we find ourselves not sure where to go or what to do next. We've reached the pinnacle, but what do I do now? And so we're going to look at what happened to David when he reached this moment of being at his pinnacle. And I'll let you know, this is going to be part one of a two-part message. Uh, we're going to be looking at the whole story of David and Bathsheba between this week and next week. And yes, I know on Mother's Day I'm preaching about Bathsheba. And some of you are like, you're preaching about Bathsheba on Mother's Day? Let me encourage you because here's the thing you got to know about me. I don't like preaching traditional holiday messages because there's some people that only enter the church on Mother's Day, Easter, Christmas, and they hear the same kind of messages over and over and over again. So I'm bringing a message about Bathsheba and about how David experienced and was given forgiveness next week. Because I know some of you, you're like, I'm going to be bringing my children, I'm going to be bringing my grandchildren they're going to walk into a message about no matter what has happened, no matter how good you are, no matter how bad you are, you have the ability to mess up, but God has the ability to cover that with the grace. So this is going to be a part two that happens next week. You're going to be like, you're not using as much scripture as you are uh, that you would typically do. Well, because a lot of it today is going to be context to set us up for next week, so I can just kind of go right at it next week and, and get right to the point. But here's the thing. David is going to have a moment where he needs to live out and walk out this integrity in this message. But for each and every one of us, we all have had that spot where we kind of feel like I've arrived and what do I do now? Do I thrive or do I uh, fall? And if we can maintain that breakthrough, it's because we have integrity and we're walking in the integrity that Jesus has given us. It takes integrity to maintain what God has given to you. But before we go any further, before we jump into the introductory scripture, I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, your word is written in my mind and hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp onto my feet and a light onto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. My greatest desire is to be a disciple and to make more disciples. I will live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. So let's go ahead and we're going to look at 2 Samuel 11.1 1, and we're going to see what David did once he becomes king. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. David took a break. Now, I want you to understand something. Taking a break is not an unbiblical idea. I mean, when we look at the whole creation story, God creates on day one through six, and on day seven, takes a Sabbath, takes an intentional rest, not because God needed it, but because he was trying to model something for us. You have to take a break. If you keep working and keep going consistently over and over and over again and you never take a moment to rest, you will burn yourself out and you're going to make bad decisions. And it's, it's almost just as bad as taking a break when you're not supposed to take a break. Now, and that's where we find David in this moment. David is taking a break that he wasn't supposed to do. David was called, he had his job as a king, and he was supposed to go to war. Hear this again. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab. David was in the wrong place. He decided to throw in the excused absence slip and take a staycation. He stayed home and sent someone else. 
The Bible doesn't give us the reason why, but you can clearly see it infers that David is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, I wonder if the overwhelming victories and everything that David's been through, he kind of finally hits that spot where I've arrived, I'm here, I can sit on the throne, I don't have to go out. And even when we look at this passage, it tells us the army is taking care of the Ammonites. They're, they're kicking their tail. It's, I mean, this is just to the left, to the right, they're winning this battle. David's not needed, but David is supposed to be there. And there's moments where God has called you to go places and to do things And you're not going, and you're not doing, and you wonder, well, why is my life falling apart? Because God has clearly spoken to you where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do, and you're refusing to do so. And you have to realize, when God calls me to do something, I'm going to go and do it. David was a shepherd boy by nature, and in his leading, in the calling of God, he was meant to design, uh, to lead men face to face, not from sitting on a throne from afar. Leads us to the first point of today's message. It's this integrity is essential. Integrity is absolutely essential. It's the practice of being honest and consistent, adhering to strong moral and ethical principles and values. In ethics, integrity is regarded as the uh, honesty and truthfulness or accuracy of one's actions. Now, I want to use a good example of this for a moment. How many of you like reading random statistics? Like, I'm, I'm the person that, like, I'll, I love when I'm watching ESPN and they're showing all these random statistics. Like, this person has never lost a game on Tuesdays when it rains and it's 50 degrees. Because I'm really wondering, like, who came up with that statistic? Uh, I'll give you a good example. I am more successful at running marathons than Tom Brady. I have never thrown an interception in the Super Bowl. I have never allowed someone to hit a grand slam off of me in the World Series. Those are all true statistics. But I wouldn't be acting in integrity if I told you those and actually meant them. Obviously, you know I'm joking. But if I walked around saying, like, I've never thrown an interception in a college football game. Yeah, you're right. I've also never thrown a pass in a college football game. We can make statistics and we can make things say what we want them to be, but integrity is saying here is not just the truth, but it's the whole truth, and we're not going to mislead you through this process. I can make any statistic say what I want it to say. I can make, and you look at even in business where companies are able to say, well, this is what this and this and this is. One of the the, the TikTok uh, individuals I enjoy following takes junk food brands and recreates the, the packaging as if it's a healthy food. I, I recently watched him do one with, like, Mountain Dew, and he, like, renames Mountain Dew, but it's using their logo, and it's all natural fruit juice because it has, like, orange juice concentrate and lime concentrate. And you look at it, and it's like, he's not lying, but it, this is not integrity either. And we can laugh about that kind of thing when you're saying, uh, well, let's rebrand Mountain Dew as a health food drink because we know it's not. But we intentionally say, well, there's no sugar. We don't mention the sugar aspect of it. We just talk about all the the good things that are in it. But when we look at our spiritual life, are we people of integrity or are we only showing you our highlight reels and hiding the bloopers that make you think that we're better than we actually are when in reality I am a sinner saved by grace? I need to not be someone who is broadcasting, here's every good thing that I've ever done but never show any of my mistakes. Because it's through sharing of testimony that people are able to see, well, this is where he was, but this is where God's got him. That means a lot more to people than, well, look at where where he or look at where she is, and I could never reach that. You've only reached it because time has passed to allow you to get there. When we look at David, we see an individual that didn't have to feel personally responsible for Goliath. But he did because he knew what God had called him to do. He didn't need to spare Saul's life, but he did because he knew what God had called him to. He didn't have to demonstrate the leadership to raise up this this ragtag group of leaders that were giant slayers known as David's mighty men. But he did because he knew what he was called to. He built a culture within himself during those years of trial when he was on the run that David's character is shown in the highlight table moments. But these small glimpses of greatness that we see were constructed on the the back of a shepherd's boy in a field that was just willing to do what God had called him to do. 
And so when we live out integrity, we start realizing here's all the things that I can be simply because I'm following after God's heart and God's desire for my life. And those years of preparation is what gets you ready for the center stage. So often people want the stage, people want the platform, people want to be able to be seen by everybody, but they're not willing to do all the work to get there. It's, hey, I read, the, I read one book of the Bible, I'm ready to get up in front of people and talk. Whew, that's scary. It's almost this fact of, if, I'll, I'll say this, if God didn't call me to do what I do, I wouldn't want to do what I do. Because when we look at scripture, teachers are, are going to be judged by God on a deeper level because I'm the one who's presenting what God's word says. It's the reason why I want you always reading God's word for yourself. Because if I say something inaccurate, I need you to catch me. Because I need to then come back up and say, hey, you know what? I thought I was right. I was wrong. And, and someone caught me on this. Let me fix, fix that detail. Because we're all in this together to sharpen one another so that we can advance and go out and win this world for Jesus Christ. So David's heart, it's when you look at this, David's heart's pushing him towards the throne. It's, it's pushing him to where he's supposed to go. Not because of title or prestige or good money or a good job or, or favor. It's because God had called him to it and he was walking out what God had for him. That brings us, though, to David's flop. You see, because we look at chapter 11 and we look at that first verse, and David's not where David's supposed to be. And it leads to probably the greatest flop, the greatest mistake of his life. He was absent from his purpose. And do you know what happens when you're absent from your purpose? What's immediately present? Temptation. As soon as you move away from your purpose, your God-given purpose, what God has designed you particularly for, that's when temptation can walk in the door. And that's what ends up happening here. So let's look at uh, verses 2 through 5 now. It happened late one afternoon. When David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Why did temptation come on the scene? Because David wasn't off fighting the battles that he was supposed to as king. David allowed himself to be somewhere that on the surface was a safe spot. He's at his home but he wasn't supposed to be there. He was off supposed to be fighting and leading a battle where Uriah was. He was expecting something out of Uriah that he wasn't expecting out of himself. Now, we'll get into more of the specifics about this next week because you can look at it and say, well, wasn't Bathsheba just as much at fault? Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, is off at war. Where do you think she thought the king would have been? I can give you a hint. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, she would have thought David would have been out of battle. David's in a spot where David's not supposed to be. It leads us to our next point this morning. It's this. Influence absent from integrity equals failure. I don't care how much influence you have. I don't care about how, well, your resources, your talents, your abilities, your money, your leadership potential. I don't care about any of that. If you lack integrity, you're going to fail over time. Your passion, your hunger, your gift will bring you before kings, but your integrity will keep you there. Let's say that again because that was good. Your passion, your hunger, your gifts, your grit will bring you before, the, uh, before kings, but your integrity will keep you there. You see, so often it's this matter of, well, I want this opportunity. I don't care what opportunities you want. What opportunities have you earned the ability to have but then you're doing the work to maintain and to keep. Your charisma will get you into rooms. Your character will keep you in that room. And the more we realize that it's not about me, but it's about the platform that God has brought me to, and we keep our eyes and we keep our attention on the platform that God has given us, it allows us to exist on a higher level because I realize I'm not in this room. I'm not in this position that I am today on my own ability. I can track it all the way back to when I was a middle school kid, and getting up in front of people and speaking freaked me out. 
and how God took me in all these life experiences that got me here for this very moment. And that I know whether it's here the rest of my life, it's somewhere else, that God is preparing me for what's next consistently because I keep saying, okay, God, what are you doing next? What are you doing next? Where are you taking us next? I don't believe it's because David was an evil man that he fell. Because David ultimately, as soon as he realizes what he's done, he's called out on it, he repents very quickly. I think what happened is that David lacked vision when he left the battlefield. Just because he left the battlefield didn't mean he was safe. In fact, the battlefield would have been a safer place for David to be. Right where God is calling you is the safest place for you to be. You see, so often you're like, well, I have these abilities, but I don't know, does does God really need me to go there? Does God really need me to do this? This is why so many missionaries can go out in full confidence of, I'm going to go out on the field, I'm going to go to the other side of the world, and people are going to say, aren't you worried about your safety? The greatest place where you are in your safety is when you're in the very spot where God's called you to be. Because when I'm where God calls me to be, I can fully trust. God has me here prepared for this moment. And if God needs me out of here, then God's going to remove me out of there. But it's when I say, God, no, I know better. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. That all of a sudden I put myself in the way where that allows temptation to come in. How do I know this? In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab. David sent somebody else when God was calling him. God raised David up to be king, not Joab to be king. But David said, you know what, I'm going to let someone else go. I'm going to lack vision, at least temporarily, and allow someone else to go. If God is calling you to serve, it's time to serve. I don't care what it is, where it is, how it is. But if God is specifically saying, I need you to do this, fill in the blank, it's time that you do it. If God's saying, hey, I really need you to give to the church, and you're being challenged and you're being pushed on. And you're like, well, God, I don't want to do that. That's uncomfortable. This is going to change things. This is going to upset things. This is going to unsettle things. And I don't know, this is going to keep me from getting this. It's time for you to give. If it's, because let me just say this. So often we want to be a part of a church. We want to be a part of something that's accomplishing something great, but we're unwilling to serve and we're unwilling to give. We're unwilling to invest into it. We want to reap the benefits of being a part of something that's great and it's growing. But then if we're unwilling to do the work, then you're never going to see that happen. I want to see it because I can say it earlier and say, hey, I want to be a church that has two services, three services, two campuses, three campuses, that we're reaching not just uh, 100 or 200 people, but we're reaching thousands for Christ because people need to hear Jesus, that we're giving to missionaries on the other side of the planet. You say, this is fantastic, this is awesome, but I'm not going to give anything to, to that. Other people can do that for me. No, if God is calling you to do it, you need to get right in where God has called you to be, doing the very things that God has called you to do. Not expecting me to do it or someone else to do it, but you need to be in the battle where God has called you to be. Because if you are ready and willing to rest in the spot where God has called you to be, it's the safest place for you. But if you say, God, you know what, that's great, someone else can do it. You begin to lack vision. When you begin to lack vision, you put yourself in a dangerous spot where temptation can, can jump in. Because being absent from the battlefield means you're present with danger. David was a man with passion, and unfortunately, when he removed the passion of fighting the battles that God has called him to fight, he found a new passion. And it's really easy to say that, well, But David just made a mistake. No, David intentionally knew what he was doing. We'll get into this more next week. But David lived in the castle. David lived lived in the highest spot in the city where David is able to look out onto the city. And you say, "Well, well, Bathsheba, she was the one who was bathing on her roof. This isn't like America where you have your own individual shower in the inside of your house and you have heated water where you just turn the faucet on and here comes hot water. Where do you think you got hot water from? You put the bathtub up on the roof, the water got heated up, and that's where your warm water came from. Bathsheba was doing what Bathsheba needed to do. David was looking upon her because he found a new passion, and it wasn't the passion God had called him to. And that so often temptation happens when we are idle, we are unengaged, or we're just simply not doing what we're supposed to do. 
We try to sedate our pain or uh, agitation by medicating with other things. We chase fun even though it's fleeting. We want romantic relationships even though they're shallow. We eat or drink more than necessary so that our brain numbs itself, also known as a dopamine fix. We sleep in longer than we should be or we stay up working uh, too long because we're trying to find value in ourselves and not in God. That we get depressed and here's what happens when all of those things come into play. We make stupid decisions decisions. How many of you have ever made a stupid decision my hands in the air? Let me encourage you with something. Some of you have heard me say this before. It's the HALT principle. Never make a decision when you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. If you're one of those four things, you need to remedy that decision before you make a life-altering decision. Because all of a sudden you say, like, I'm really hungry, and it's after church, and, you, like, you're looking at your spouse, and, like, you're ready to get into a fight. Go grab a Snickers and then have the conversation. <laughs> if you're angry, you got to go calm down. You need to go somewhere. You, you need to find a safe person where you can say what you need to say, and then they can say, okay, now that you've said it, calm down. Or lonely. Like, hey, get into a proper community. By the way, just a little commercial. Anchor Group started today, and uh, they're beginning all through the course of this week. If you have not signed up for one yet, Pastor Cheryl, where are you at? Is she in here? Yeah, there she is. Front row, look at that. Like, come and find her afterwards and say, what groups are open? When are they open? I need to get into community. Because here's the thing I need you to hear. The same statement I made earlier, that when people so often say, well, the church is getting too big, I'm not comfortable. It's because you're not finding pockets of community within the church. As the church grows bigger, we have to intentionally grow smaller so we can have those relationships. An anchor group is the primary way of doing that here at the Shores Church so that you can be discipled in the word of God, but you can also be around people that when life throws its worst at you, you can say, hey, I've got my immediate community that I can just reach out to and say, would you help me? Would you support me? And when you're tired, sometimes you just got to take a nap. Like, I'm bad about this sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, I can just push through. Like, there's moments where Annie just looks at me and like, go, go lay down in bed and take a nap. And I'm like, I don't want to. It's like, I'm some kind of four-year-old again, just like fighting the nap. Of No, go take a nap. You're tired. You're making bad decisions. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. When you don't have vision, you just throw everything out. It's, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, and I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm just not going to worry about it. But when you follow the law, you follow what God has called you to do, you'll be amazed how all of a sudden everything just makes sense. There's those moments where you feel it's like that struggle of, like, well, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do this or how I'm going to do that. And it's those ideas where, you know what, I'm just going to take the next step. I'm going to put the next foot in front of this foot, and I'm just going to keep walking because I might feel like I'm in a fog. I might feel like I don't know where I'm going, what I'm doing, how I'm going to get there, but I can see enough to take the next step. The problem is when you don't take any steps and you stay exactly where you are. And then you get disoriented and you say, well, maybe I will take a step. But instead of taking the step in the direction you're supposed to go, you start taking a step in this direction because you got disoriented. No, when God says go, begin taking the steps that you know you're supposed to take. Revelation is God's divine instruction. It's the north star. It's our compass. It points us in the direction we're supposed to go. And when God has something for you, just like he had something for David, uh, it's the, that mindset when we don't pay attention to what he has for us, we start making bad decisions. And when we make bad decisions, we go places that God never designed us to be, and we end up doing things that we never were supposed to do. So what would it look like if the church moved together in integrity? Because here's the thing. We all need to do it together. It's one thing to say this person is a person of integrity. This person will follow and do what God's called them to do. But imagine if all of a sudden our church begins moving in integrity, where we get serious about God's word. We get serious about loving other people. We get serious about speaking the truth but speaking it in love. We get serious about serving and wanting to reach our community. We get serious about giving and just pouring out freely like the church in the book of Acts did. All of a sudden, we can see revival start happening. We love that word revival. It's a buzzword revival of we want to see this uh, re revival. We want to see God bring something back to life. Well, one, I hear me how I say this. This is one of those things that like if, 
If you're watching on YouTube right now and you, you clip this, then you're taking this out of context. But so often, like, I, I kind of get tired of the word revival. And here's why. Because in order to have revival, that means something had to die. I don't want us to always have to live in this state of we need revival, we need revival. I want to just thrive. I want there just to be life. Like, let's get one more good revival going and then let's go full steam ahead. Let's put everything we have into it. Because in order to continually need a revival every single year, that means I'm going to get excited about God for about a, for a solid week, and then it's going to linger for a month, and then all of a sudden I'm going to go back into my old habits. I don't, I don't desire that. I don't have time for that. I want the church to be alive and the church to begin moving and taking ground. Because when I look at eternity, it's not going to be like, you know what, God, let me get to heaven and then I'm going to be really serious that first week of eternity of worshiping you. And then I'm going to go like putz around in the mansion that you made for me. And then I'll come up out maybe once a year and I'll say, hi, God, thank you for what you did. But I'm going to go back to my mansion that you gave me. No, it's about living for God. I want every person that ever walks into this church to experience Jesus. I want them to experience Jesus on a level where they walk in and I don't know what just hit me, but something is different here. And as every person experiences Jesus, then all of a sudden they have this desire to become intentionally discipled and meet Jesus and understand, say, something happened. I experienced something, but I need to know more about this. I need to know what's going on here because it's different. Where all of a sudden, because we know our word, we're able to say, hey, let me point you to Jesus because let me just encourage you with this. As the church grows, we're going to need more anchor group leaders. Some of you in this room, you're like, well, I could never be an anchor group leader. What if God's calling you to be an anchor group leader and is calling you into a season of preparation now because a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, the church is running 1,000 people and I'm like, I need you to be a, a an anchor group leader because I need you to intentionally disciple people that just experienced Jesus because every person matters to God. And as that happens, we start realizing, oh, I, I don't want to just be kind of plugged in or kind of doing this. I want to be someone that is joyfully generous with everything that I have, my time, my talent, my abilities, my resources. I want to pour into the kingdom. I want to invest in the kingdom. L let me just put this out there. Let's say that I could tell you, I could give you the magic stock where if you put money into it, it was going to make a 100% return every month. You'd be like, what's the stock? Like, are you like, is this like back to the future? Did you go and get the almanac and come back and now you can tell me like how I can become a millionaire? Except it's the kingdom of God. How much greater? Because any, anything you have here will be nothing in heaven. You do not get to take a U-Haul with you. You don't get to say, God, like, here's my best stuff from, from earth. No, you get to take people with you. And as you become joyfully generous, you'll realize that this is just not about your time, your talent, your ability, your resources, your money. It's about people making it to heaven. And again, we want to pray and we want to believe that our loved ones will make it to heaven. What if you get to be the answer to someone else's prayer about their loved one? And what if someone else gets to be the answer to your prayer for your loved one? Let's start paying it forward. Let's start reaching people. Let's start going at it with everything we have. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm just going to kind of check as many boxes as I can without fully committing my life to Jesus. No, we don't have time for that. We don't have time to kind of just fake it or do it 50% or 60%. This Christian walk is 100%. Jesus gave up his life on the cross for us. And then we say, well, I want to follow after Jesus. Do you really? Because Jesus was definitely someone of integrity. And what did Jesus do? He took what he said so serious. I mean, he even went before God in the garden and said, okay, if there's any other way, let that other way happen. But I'm ready. I'm prepared. I will go to that cross if I need to go to that cross because these people matter. And as we become joyfully generous, we start saying, you know what, I'm invested. I want to be a part of the common unity of that church. I want to do everything I can to help that church grow so that more people can meet Jesus and start the cycle all over again. Let's just take a second to imagine what this world could look like if not just our church, but all the churches in, in America and all the churches around the world got serious about this. There could be a transformation in families because believers are modeling healthy families and families that are struggling, the families that don't know what to do or how to get to where they're supposed to go can look at Christian families and say, hey, you guys have your life together. What are you doing differently? That people with every sickness and disease can get healed just like when Jesus prayed. 
that all of a sudden it's not just a matter. Now, hear me. I fully believe that God has the ability to work miracles through doctors, that he can give wisdom to doctors and nurses. But I also really enjoy the stories where all of a sudden God just conf uh, confounds the, the minds of doctors and nurses. Where like, I don't know what just happened, but like, this is a miracle. Like, where is Lenny? Is Lenny back there somewhere? He, uh, perfect timing for me to, to call on Lenny. When, when Lenny walks back in, let's just like cheer and go crazy for Lenny just to kind of throw him off and surprise him. Two weeks ago, we prayed for him, and be, we were praying for him because it wasn't looking good, and Lenny's in church today. Like when I, when I visited with him in the hospital earlier this week, it was like, I'm feeling better. This is going good. Like I want to be in church on Sunday. Is that okay? I'm like, absolutely it's okay if you're in church on Sunday. Because here's the thing that we need to realize is that God is working miracles both practically, both through doctors and, and nurses, but also supernaturally. And when we look at it, we can realize that God can heal every sickness and disease because God is the author of life. God is the great physician. Imagine if we actually acted like it. That nations can forgive one another. All of a sudden we're like, well, we don't like this nation because, no, we're all created in the image of God. Even the people you don't like especially the people you don't like. Or, well, they don't look like me. They don't act like me. They don't believe like I believe. Who cares? Were they created in the image of God? Yes. Then did Jesus die on their behalf? Yes. And Lenny, we're so excited to see you this morning. Church, when you said, like, hey, let's, let's pray for him two weeks ago, and we prayed for him, like, I firmly believe Lenny is here today because of prayer. Prayer works. So as we keep going through this, what if all of a sudden we had businesses that began funding the gospel worldwide and demonstrated the kingdom in the marketplace? Because here's the thing. I might represent the kingdom in the pulpit, but I do that with a pure intention so that you can go represent the kingdom in the marketplace. My job is to not win the world. My job is to disciple the saints to do the work of the ministry so that Jesus' name can be made famous in each and every place that you go. But that means you have to act with bold confidence that God has called me here. God has prepared me for this moment so that I can do what God has called me to do. You cannot walk in, in this passive, well, I don't know. If I get an opportunity, I'll do something. And I'll tell you this, like as an introvert, there's moments where I'm like, can I just get in and out of a store and not talk to anyone and just get home? Like I understand that. If you say, like, well, but when God speaks, you got to obey. When the Holy Spirit says you need to go and talk to that person, you need to go and pray for this person, you've got to obey. That we could have artists within the church that, like, here's the thing, and many of you know this. Christian media, Christian movies, Christian TV shows, they're getting better with time. They are. But imagine if all of a sudden, because when you look back in the day, the greatest, best art was coming out of the church. But we lost that at some point in time. But imagine if all of a sudden the greatest art, the greatest movies, the greatest TV shows all of a sudden could demonstrate God's purpose and presence and love for the world. Imagine what that could look like. Where believers begin to contribute to the eradication of sex trafficking and drug trafficking. It's one thing to say, well, let's try and legislate it out of, um, out of, out of existence. You're never going to legislate it out of existence, but we can pray it out of existence. Because people at one point in time said, well, Roe v. Wade, that's never going to go away. Roe v. Wade got turned over because there's a whole lot of prayer. And now I know Michigan's got its, its own issues, but hey, if it happened once, it can happen again. And that's where we pray. That's where we're consistent. That's where we, we do what God has called us to do, fight the battles that God has called us to fight. And let me just and say this, and I'm just going to put it out there for the record. If you're struggling with pornography, you're a part of the problem of sex trafficking. Because most, I can say the vast majority of those people that are in pornography are not there because they're excited about getting a paycheck. They're there because they're being taken advantage of and potentially were kidnapped just for your enjoyment. Just throwing that out there. Educating uh, our, and discipling our children into God-given destinies, helping them realize where God has called them to. Now, when I look at each and every one of us, we all have stories. Some of our stories are exciting stories and exciting testimonies. Some of our stories are boring testimonies. But I think most of us that would say, oh, I've got an exciting testimony, would look at the boring testimony and say, I want my kids to have the boring testimony. 
I want to know about the sovereign uh, power of God, about how God can protect, that God can, can rewrite stories for generations and generations, that we can see the end of poverty, we can see uh, the end of injustice, we can see financial resources coming and, and bringing homes to the homeless, that we could see the world have clean access to clean water all around the world. We could keep running this list on, but here's the irony of it. We want these things to exist, but we don't want to participate in them. We want someone else to do it. We want someone else to serve in that capacity that God's called me to serve in. We want someone else to give the money to accomplish that task. That is not integrity. That's called being a hypocrite. Well, I want the opportunity, but I don't want the investment. No, you get the opportunity because you put in the investment. When we look at David, David's in this spot. Because he allowed God to use him, he gets raised up to this spot of being king. But now he has to live out this integrity, and he made a mistake. And when we look at the story, what we can see at first is he makes a series of mistakes. David is not perfect. This is that moment where I always tell you that David would, would look at things and say, like, he's fighting Goliath. Oh, I want to be like David. Oh, David is sparing Saul's life. I wish I could be like that. But we, we kind of blot this story out when we study David. Like, I want to be like David and take advantage of a man's wife when he's off the war when I'm supposed to be. David made mistakes here. And even then, he kind of compounds it. He makes it worse at first. Because what's his answer? Not admitting it at first. He tries to bring Uriah back from war and bring him back and say, well, go and sleep with your wife so that we can kind of pretend like this isn't my, my mistake, that this is your blessing. But that's not what happens because Uriah has too much integrity. Because he says, no, I can't do that. I can't come. Like, even when he gets called back in, he will not lay down in his own bed simply because everyone else is off at war. It's not right for me to do this. He has more integrity than David does in this moment. And then ultimately, David has Uriah killed because of this. And he's like, well, does he have integrity? He does, but he misses it for this moment because of his, his fall, because of his mistake, because he allowed himself to be in a position that he wasn't supposed to be in. He temporarily loses this uh, in integrity. He loses this knowledge of who he is. And what I want you to realize is I never want you to lose focus on what God has placed right in front of you. Your family, the friends, the believers that you live around, your job, uh, where your schooling, wherever it is, how can you bring revival? How can you bring life? How can you bring energy into that spot? David wins back this integrity. David gets himself back on the right path. But here's the thing, and we'll dive really into this next week. This mistake on David's behalf changes the entire direction of his life. And it causes all sorts of issues. And as we talk next week about forgiveness, hear this. Is God can forgive anything and can use anything. Jesus comes out of this mistake. Out of this mistake with Bathsheba, God is able to redeem it and restore it, but it doesn't mean that there's not consequences for it. And this is one of the things I want you to realize with integrity. David has this momentary lapse of integrity. He messes up. Now, he redeems it. He, he restores it. He turns it over to God when he's called out on it. But imagine if David would have just simply did what David was supposed to do. Where could the nation of Israel have went? What could things have looked like had he not made this mistake? And that's what I, I want for you. That's what I want. Um, and I think if, if David was here and was talking to you today, when you get to heaven and you say, like, David, give me your advice, like, I think David will probably focus more on this mistake of like, hey, I wish I could have did this, but God. What could God do? How could God move? If I could have the worship team go ahead and come forward. We're going to take communion in just a minute, but I want to give you some insights into integrity for a moment that you can be some takeaways for you today. It's the first thing is this, is David should have been involved. Never leave the spot where God is calling you to be. I will be here as long as God calls me to be here, and when God calls me to, to go, I'll be gone that day. Because I don't desire to have a position or to have a title. I desire to be in the very spot where God has called me to be. I want that same thing for you. If God all of a sudden says, hey, I want you to go and be a missionary on the other side of the planet. Hey, my role is to help equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. I'm here. I'm in your corner. I want to help send you. 
If you want to say, hey, God wants to use me in, in the, the workplace, let's do it. If one of our students says, hey, I feel like God's calling me to lead a Bible study, okay, let's, as, as adults, as leaders, as youth leaders, let's come around them and support them so they can go and do what God's called them to do and be exactly where God has called them to be, to be involved. The second one is this, is God has given us a hunger that's meant to be fulfilled by him. We need to not make room for temptation. And the only way we can not make room for temptation is to only be fulfilled by that which Jesus has called us to. When you start going out, well, I want this opportunity and I want that opportunity, that's great. Is it the opportunity that God wants you to have? What's God calling you to lay down right now of saying, you know, I've been holding on to this. I think this is a great idea. This is, this is a great dream. Is God saying lay it down? Is God saying give up on it because I've got something different for you? We should only be satisfied by what God has for us, how God wants to fulfill us, because otherwise we put ourselves into difficult, dangerous positions. We stay at home and we should be off at war. Number three is this, is integrity means we keep our word and we stay faithful. When we say we're going to do something, do it. If David would have followed through on what he was supposed to do, this whole story we're learning this week and next week doesn't happen. When you say, I'm going to do something, follow through. There's people that would look at it and say, well, the church is filled with, with hypocrites. Hey, there's been moments where I've messed up. I'll acknowledge that. But if I'm honest where I, here's my mess ups, but here's where I'm trying, all of a sudden we don't look so much like a hypocrite. We look like somebody who is imperfect but is trying. And we love people through their mistakes as well. Number four, we decide now what we will do when our faith is tested. Here's the reason why so many people fall into temptation. They have no plan whatsoever. They have no guide rails that are put up. Go on the expressway today. There's a reason why you have guardrails in the middle of um, the, the, the highway. It's because if all of a sudden you make a mistake, it prevents you from going all the way to the other side of the, uh, the highway. Or it prevents you from falling off the side. Like, hey, this might be a nasty accident, but it's better than it could have been. It's the same kind of thing with our, our life and temptation. If we have our plan in place before temptation ever comes, it helps us stay in the pro proper lane. You say, well, I'm missing out on opportunities. I don't get to do this, and I don't get to do that. You're right. God's protecting you from things that you could have chosen to do, but is going to cause you issues. And number five is this is probably the most important one that you need to hear, is that God can redeem every mistake. Every mistake that you've made, that you're making, or you might make, God can redeem. And here's the, the problem that happens that Satan is so incredibly good at doing, is allowing that mistake to live in your mind rent-free when God's calling you to evict it. And you think about what I did today, what I did last month, what I did six years ago, what I did a decade ago, what I did 30 years ago, and you keep living off that mistake. God has already forgiven you if you are in Christ Stop dwelling on that. Stop allowing that mistake to prevent you from where you're going. Now, hear this. Sometimes, and you might th think, well, yeah, but my mistake prevents me from doing this. Sure, there's consequences. David experienced consequences. We're going to talk about David's consequences next week. But that doesn't mean that you can't do anything. Some people allow a, a consequence to prevent them from doing anything whatsoever. We're going to take communion right now. But I want you to, to hear this passage, and then we're going to go into to worshiping and uh, sing Run to the Father. But here's the communion passage we're going to read today. This is Luke 22. It's not going to be on the screen, so just listen to it. Verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined a table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. Usually we kind of stop in this general area, but let's keep going a little bit. A dispute 
also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves, as he's preparing to go to the cross, as he's washing their feet, as he is setting up everything for them. They're worried about who's going to be perceived as the greatest. Let me encourage you, if you're living a life of integrity and you're putting Jesus Christ first, you're not worried about whether you're the greatest or you're the least. You're just grateful that you have an opportunity to serve. 